The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. So in the midst of sort of general concerns that the Trump team is completely unprepared to be taking control of the United States, listen to the list of problems that we now know the Trump transition team is having. Number one, it is total and utter chaos within the Trump transition team after the removal of Chris Christie and the replacement of Chris Christie with Mike Pence to actually run the transition team itself. And you might hope, well, that decision was probably made for some reason that would make the transition team run more effectively. But lo and behold, no, the Obama administration notified the press that they had not yet received a memo from Mike Pence, which allows the Obama administration and the incoming uh, president elect Trump administrations to start formally discussing how to hand off the government. That's sort of a big deal. You sort of need to figure that out and have limited time to do it. This signed paper did eventually show up hours late. And the weird thing is, it was the same document that Chris Christie had previously signed when he was heading up the transition team. So it raises the question of if the document wasn't changed, why couldn't the Trump team just get Mike Pence to sign this piece of paper and get it over to the Obama administration? Trump transition team officials just didn't show up at the Pentagon for discussions about that transition. Trump officials just didn't show up at the Department of Energy, which, by the way, is responsible for keeping those nuclear codes that we are all really, really scared about Trump having anything to do with and no business having anything to do with those. Trump's team officials just didn't show up when the Department of Energy was expecting them on Monday. No one at the Justice Department has heard from the Trump team. And the question is, what is causing all of this? Lack of organization is part of it. But another element of the root cause is that the Trump transition team, and this is insane, who wouldn't want to be a part of a presidential administration? The Trump team is having a difficult time finding able minded Republicans that are even willing to work with them. And red alert, a Democratic source who, uh, like others, would only discuss what's going on on the condition of anonymity, said that transition officials have been informally asking Obama appointees to recommend Republicans to take over their jobs. This is so pathetic, guys. They no call, no show. And then they don't know who to hire. Hey, Obama administration. Could you recommend some Republicans to us so that we can maybe get this thing moving? Well, it's pretty funny how Chris Christie was in charge of the transition team when the prospect of a Donald Trump presidency was just wishful thinking. Yeah. And now that it's become a reality, Mike Pence is in charge. And Rachel, I mean, when we think about this, you've got all of these Republicans everywhere who seem desperate to have positions of power. All of a sudden now, none of them are jumping at the opportunity to work in the Trump administration. But I also feel like because Trump doesn't have a lot of experience, he doesn't have this long list of officials from the Bush era to tap from. So where is he looking to? Yeah, well, he was going to put the best people around him. And apparently he can't even put people around him who can then find people to put around him. I mean, we're getting v several levels removed here from Trump being the really great manager that he says he's going to be. And very telling is that Elliot Cohen, who was a longtime neoconservative voice, he tweeted about the total chaos and disorder that's going on within the Trump transition team. We're going to put that tweet up for you saying after exchange with Trump transition team changed my recommendation. Stay away. Their angry, arrogant, screaming, you lost will be ugly. And then in the midst of this, you have Rince Priebus, according to sources, who uh, is going to be the White House chief of staff, leaving his role as RNC chair. He is now very concerned about the possibility of Corey Lewandowski, former Trump campaign manager and, and CNN contributor. Corey Lewandowski may be named RNC chair. And Rince Priebus is very concerned about that. The Republicans are scared of what the Republicans under Trump are going to do. I understand that. But kind of going back to the unraveling, I'm wondering if the catalyst for this was giving so much power to Jared Kushner and saying, oh, he can make decisions kind of based on emotions and saying, I'm going to dismiss Rogers because uh, when Chris Christie was a uh, federal prosecutor, he put my father in jail or saying uh, that Rogers 
uh, agreed with uh, Obama in saying that he had uh, he didn't mislead the public in terms of Benghazi, and that starkly contrasts with Trump's narrative about Benghazi. So let's just dismiss him. Yeah, well, Jared Kushner, of course, Trump's son-in-law, who by all indications has a very, very, uh, has very significant influence, Pat, over Donald Trump. And it's unclear exactly what his role is going to be in the administration. We haven't really heard much about it. I warned you, Trump is not qualified to run the country. We've been saying it for a while. He likes the hunt of it. He likes the competition. He wants the power he sees associated with it. But now that he's won, it's abundantly clear he's not interested in governing. And we really don't know which sectors of the Republican Party is going to be in charge because there's the alt-right uh, group like Stephen, Stephen Bannon. Yeah. And then there's the more establishment types like Ryan's Priebus. We don't yeah. know who's going to take over. And but, we're hearing about Giuliani yeah. and Newt Gingrich and so many well, others. Yeah, but Giuliani says it's all fine because this happened with Reagan and Clinton. So it, it's, this is normal. Yeah, I trust Rudy Giuliani inherently, <laughs> especially after he told us the FBI was leaking him information or at least implied it. I've been talking about the Trump, what I call insta flips or backtracking with regard to his campaign promises. We talked about that Mexico wall. More than likely, it'll be some fencing on some part of the southern border. And of course, he'll claim that he did it and made America great again by doing it. Prosecuting Hillary Clinton, which he said he would do in, in one of the debates. That seems like it is no longer a priority anymore. Obamacare, which he was just saying was a disaster during the campaign. He actually likes some of those provisions, quote, very much. And one of the Trump major campaign promises with tax cuts, right? Huge tax cuts. Republicans will control the House. They'll control the Senate. They'll control the White House. If there is ever an opportunity to do major, major tax cuts, it's when Republicans will control the House, Senate and White House, right? Well, it turns out that those tax cuts probably are not going to be as large as Donald Trump bragged about and promised during his campaign. Why? Well, actual people who know stuff are insisting that they're just going to be too expensive. It would explode the deficit like we've been saying for a year, costing somewhere between six and seven trillion dollars. This is called the real world. When Republicans are concerned your tax cuts might be too big, you've hit rock bottom and House Republicans put together a slightly more deficit friendly idea. And it's just it's stunning, guys, that the the House Republicans have to talk sense on tax cuts to the president elect. We're in a bizarro world of some kind. I know this is somewhat standard, but how is this kind of going to affect the constructive receipt tax doctrine or pay me in 2017 type of issue? It's going to be a disaster. And, and when we look at the specifics of what Trump actually wants to do, he's already revised the income tax rates that he promised. So initially he was talking about three income tax rates, 10 percent, 20 percent and 25 percent. Now he has changed those to match those rates proposed by the House plan to 12 percent, 25 percent and 33 percent. Another element of the House plan uh, is a bigger standard deduction on uh, federal taxes. There's also likely to be some negotiations over the tax rate for small businesses and partnerships. Currently, the rate is at 35 percent. Trump wants to go to 15 percent for corporations, 39 percent uh, and rather to 15 percent from nearly 40 percent for sole proprietorships and partnerships. But the House plan would only cut that uh, to 25 percent, which is 10 points higher than what Donald Trump wants. There are major differences, Pat, between what Trump has been running on and wants to do and what Trump is already saying he will do. Never mind what the House is saying that he should do. And the things that he ran on were spending proposals, things like the wall and the immigration task force. Yeah. But he never seemed to come up with a way of paying for it because he also promised tax cu tax cuts. Yeah. Of course, that's going to raise the deficit. And this is the huge, huge, huge red alert here, which is that the lowest tax rate under Trump's new plan, 12 percent, is higher than the lowest tax rate that already exists right now. Think about how regressive this tax cut is, as is usually the case with these right wing uh, tax cuts. If Trump goes for the House plan, there will be a tax break for the top 0.2 percent through no estate tax, which is a horribly regressive tax. The top tax rate for the highest earners would go from 39.6 percent to 33 percent. The middle tax rate would basically stay similar at 25 percent. But that lowest rate would go from 10 percent to 12 percent. We're talking about a tax increase for some of those in the lowest tax bracket. What happened to helping the little guy, Rachel, which is what Trump ran on making America great again for the middle classes?
I'm not really sure, but besides for swapping interest deduction with expensing, has he named a single tax preference that he wants to eliminate? Uh, well, let's see. He <laughs> wants to eliminate. I mean, he talks about loopholes, getting rid of loopholes or something. I don't know. It, it, are fraud there, and waste. Fraud That's and waste specific. we're going to get rid of. No, I have. I mean, he wants to cha make some changes to the mortgage uh, deduction, mortgage interest deduction. That's a change, right? I suppose. I just haven't read anything specific. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> the problem with the Trump proposals, that there is nothing specific. And, and most of them, like all of the others we've been talking about, fall apart very quickly when it's time to actually legislate. You can't write this stuff. Former presidential candidate, neurosurgeon and hypnotherapist Ben Carson is not accepting a role in the Trump in, uh, administration because, wait for it, he doesn't have the experience necessary to do so. I mentioned last week <laughs> that Ben Carson was being considered for Secretary of Health and Human Services. It was reported early yesterday that he actually had been offered the position. Uh, he has not acknowledged that it was directly offered to him. But according to his business manager, Armstrong Williams, Ben Carson will, would not or will not be accepting such a position. I'm going to put up the explanation from Armstrong Williams as to why. Listen to this. Dr. Carson was never offered a specific position, but everything was open to him. Dr. Carson feels he has no government experience. He's never run a federal agency. The last thing he would want to do was take a position that could cripple the presidency. Wait, 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 wait. He ran for president and was at one point a front runner, but he's not interested in being one of 15 cabinet members, all of which, if you believe Armstrong Williams, were open to him because he lacks experience, but he thought that he could be president of the United States. Yeah, you know, Secretary of Health and Human Services sounds like a lot of responsibility. I'd be better off as president of the United States. <laughs> Was this some sort of strategic type of vanity campaign? I I'm really unsure, but now he's positioned himself where he's in a place to make millions as a keynote speaker for hire. Yeah. Right. We've long suspected that Ben Carson's presidential run was just a ploy to sell his books. Yeah. Because even when he was leading in the Republican primaries, he took some time off from the campaign trail. Yeah. For his so all this, important book it has tour. To be true. Yeah. To get fresh clothes. But isn't this the? I, but isn't this the problem with vanity campaigns? Because you're taking away resources from where they're necessary. Of course. And later Tuesday, Carson, I guess, realizing that the initial explanation from Armstrong Williams was a disaster, came out with his own clarification or something, which we will look at. My decision not to seek a cabinet position in the Trump administration has nothing to do with the complexity of the job, as is being reported by some news outlets. I believe it is vitally important for the Trump administration to have many outspoken friends and advisors who are outside of the Washington bubble. It is vital to have independent voices of reason and reconciliation. If our nation is to heal and regain its greatness, I will continue to work with the transition team and beyond as we build a dynamite executive branch of government. I guess he's saying he's more useful as an advisor than as a cabinet member or something. I truly don't understand this explanation. And what I've come to realize, I think people in the audience who have heard me talk about this before, it'll resonate with them. The entire Trump campaign and clearly the administration is going to be governed by something called the Peter principle. I'm going to put up for you what the Peter principle is. The Peter principle is a concept in management theory that the selection of a candidate for a position is based on the candidate's performance in their current role rather than on abilities relevant to the intended role. Thus, employees only stop being promoted once they can no longer perform effectively and managers rise to the level of their incompetence. The best example is imagine a fast food restaurant. You get hired as a burger flipper and you kill it. You're just the best burger flipper that there is out there. So you get promoted to the person who uh, rings up people up at the cash is that you're the cashier. You're now taking the orders. And because you were able to learn the sort of technical aspects of flipping burgers, you're able to learn the technical aspects of collecting payment and running the cash register. And you're killing it as the best damn cashier at this fat fast food place. And because you stand out as the best cashier, you obviously have to get promoted to shift supervisor, except you have absolutely no interpersonal skills such that you could be managing and delegating tasks. So you get promoted up until the point at which you're no longer good at your job. This is the Peter principle, and it is very much at play in the Trump administration.
Yeah, and if we they take another look at that Armstrong Williams quote, it yeah. seems like he was offered pretty much any position he wanted. That's what that he says. That includes Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State. Yeah. We're going to entrust Ben Carson with those kind of positions. If that's true, that's the scariest part of the quote from Armstrong Williams, which is that not only is he turning this down, uh, regardless of whether or not it was formally offered, he could have had any one of those positions. And that is very, very scary. And fortunately, listen, whatever the reason... It's good that Ben Carson is not going to be uh, a secretary in the Trump administration. That is a very, very good thing. I'm on Twitter at DPacman. We'll take a break. We've got Patriot Mail coming up for you and much, much more. The David Pakman Show at DavidPakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Today's new member of the day is Marsha Harris. Marsha, thank you for supporting alternatives to corporate media. You can sign up and join Marsha at davidpakman.com slash membership. Remember that coupon code IVOTED17 is our post-election 40% discount. You can also get a free 2017 David Pakman Show calendar with your membership at davidpakman.com slash calendar17. All right. It is a new era for Patriot Mail. We have all sorts of new Patriot Mail introductions that we will be debuting, including this one today. Because it's time to make America hate again. <laughs> Patriot Mail. Written by Patriots who hate David Pakman. Because America. And because freedom. All right, we've got a double dose of Patriot Mail today. As you know, the anti-Semitism has exploded after the election of Donald Trump as president-elect, as I told you last week. It continues. The first of two here, we talked about this one in particular. It's much more compelling when read professionally. That is episode one of two for today of Patriot Mail. Let's take a listen. You are a filthy Jew fag. You've made Russia the boogeyman for no reason. Typical Jew tactic. All the elites are left-wing godless Jews. Right. Hey, dumb commie Jew, you're not America. You are a despicable leftist leech that hates this country, and we hate you back. You've been trumped, Jew fag. The Jew has been defeated. Yeah. So, okay, that was actually the new one. And then we will go also, because we are doing a double dose of post-Trump hate, this is the, the specific one that I discussed in more detail earlier this week. Jew media failed. You're nothing but an inbred kike gas chamber rat, Pacman. Mm. No one listened to this shit Jew media this election, and no one ever will again. Everyone is now aware of you kikes promoting white genocide. You are fing finished, Jew boy. Enjoy your new president. Yeah, so we're going to be talking more about this. There has been a significant uptick in this type of thing. Believe me, I am I am not the only person targeted by this type of post Trump rhetoric. We're going to get more into the data next. What I can say in the short run about this is uh, corporate media failed us. We cannot allow this type of thing and the Steve Bannons and all of that to be normalized in any way. And the best ways to su support independent media, which you can do at davidpackman.com slash membership coupon code Patriot 40 Patriot 40 turn Patriot mail into something positive. Also get your calendars at davidpackman.com slash calendar 17. So we've been generally talking about the up uptick in anti-Semitic hate incidents since the election of Donald Trump as president elect of the United States. The Anti-Defamation League Center on Extremism has been monitoring the reports very, very closely, and they have found a huge surge in the proliferation of racist and anti-Semitic graffiti and vandalism. This includes the use of swastikas and other Nazi imagery. There's been a sharp spike in the reports of these incidents, as well as other incidents related to identity hate, which we will talk about. Just a few examples to, to get us sort of started. Uh, in Crown Heights in Brooklyn, near my old neighborhood in Brooklyn, a swastika was spray painted on the sidewalk, a traditionally Jewish neighborhood. A church in Brown County, Indiana, was vandalized with a swastika, and it said, uh, Heil Silver Spring Church Trump 
as well as homophobic slurs. There was a swastika and the words Sig Heil 2016 spray painted very early or late, I guess, the way depending on how you sort of uh, characterize it on election night at a storefront in South Philadelphia. And nearby, there was an SUV spray painted with the words Trump rules and Trump black bitch. And I had two stories from being home in Western Massachusetts over the weekend where there was a sort of rock face on a hiking trail in East Hampton, Massachusetts, that was covered in anti-Semitic pro Trump graffiti, as well as a swastika carved into the sidewalk near a synagogue in Greenfield, Massachusetts. The stories go on and on and on, Rachel, and the numbers don't lie on this. There is an, an emboldening of this type of idea. I don't think more people believe this stuff right now than two weeks ago, but more people are emboldened in making these beliefs public. That's what I think has changed. There's been not so subtle anti-Semitism all throughout Trump's campaign. I don't know if we're just forgetting that he's retweeted neo-Nazis. Yeah. He had that image of Hillary Clinton with cash and a Jewish star, which he later changed to a circle. Right. And then he had that closing image on his TV ad, which had Janet Yellen and George Soros and Lloyd Blankfein. So I, I feel like this has been apparent and now it's kind of coming to the coming uh, forth in uh, large ways. And the ADL has also been keeping a close watch more generally, Pat, on white supremacist and extremist groups and their reactions to the Trump victory. And they're thrilled. I mean, there's an array of white supremacists, including those associated with the alt right that are celebrating Andrew Anglin, a known neo Nazi who runs the Daily Stormer website wrote a column talking about we won and how great it all is. James Edwards is a white supremacist who runs the political cesspool. It's a radio show based in Tennessee. He wrote, I hope President Trump shows them no mercy. Don't be magnanimous. Crush the defeated, especially those in the media and make America great again. Kevin McDonald, a well-known anti-Semite and a retired professor, wrote that Trump's win is, quote, a victory of white people over the oligarchic hostile elites, read Jews and adding Trump's victory is a blow to the entire Jewish power structure. I guess that's ignoring Trump's own daughter who's Jewish. They don't seem to care about that or are rationalizing away, rationalizing it away. In any case, this is America now. They love Trump's victory. And you have to wonder what these anti-Semites think that a President Trump is going to do for them. Right. Because of sure. Sure. I mean, Steve Bannon's on his um, advisory team. Yeah. But President Trump, President elect Trump has a daughter, a son in law and grandchildren who are Jewish. Yeah. And as we talked about earlier in the show, Rachel mentioning Jared Kushner, uh, President uh, elect Trump's son in law, presumably going to have a pretty significant role here. I suggested yesterday, Rachel, and I wonder what you think about this, that the reason that the uh, white supremacist right likes Trump is not necessarily because of what they think Trump will do, but because the entire scene is going to maybe make those who fear the rise of white supremacy lash out in some way, which will then justify violence against them. I, I mean, I'm sort of reaching here, but I'm trying to figure out what it is that they love because, yeah, the, you know, the Mexican wall is probably never going to happen. The Muslim ban probably isn't going to happen, although Trump's talking about Muslim registration. We'll deal with that tomorrow. What is it that they expect to get from this? I'm not really sure what they expect to get from this, but I hear a lot of people saying that this is what we are getting from a type of backlash election, very similar to Nixon's in 1968, and that our failure to address the frustrations of the working white middle class is, is resulting in this. Yeah, I, I think that there's definitely a strong element of that, and there's also a strong element of this is the first time that white supremacy played a role during the campaign and it wasn't immediately dismissed by Trump. He eventually did disavow David Duke and after saying he doesn't know who he is, even though he did, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that is definitely different. This campaign and the ADL is tracking it and we're going to continue tracking it as well. There's a movement on the right about racism, which sort of ranges from there's no such thing as racism to we should never accuse anyone of being racist to you can never really know if someone is racist. Well, there's a West Virginia official uh, who will uh, now be uh, one who has resigned and another one who has been put on leave because of a reference to Michelle Obama, the first lady, as an ape in heels. I'm referring to Pamela Ramsey Taylor, the director of the Clay County Development Corp, which provides services to elderly and low income residents. The mayor of Clay, West Virginia, has also resigned as a result of this. And she was 
celebrating the victory of Donald Trump in the presidential election and the elevation of Melania Trump to first lady, which is very, very scary to a lot of people. And she wrote, it will be so refreshing to have a classy, beautiful, dignified first lady back in the White House. I'm tired of seeing a ape in heels, not an ape, but a ape. Beverly Whaling, the mayor of Clay, responded on Facebook by saying that just made my day, Pam. The mayor really, really liking this. A petition calling for Whaling to be fired received more than 121,000 signatures as of midday yesterday. In her own apology, the mayor denied that her sentiments were racist. Bear in mind, 121,000 signatures. The town of Clay has a population of 400 and 91 people, none of whom are black, according to the latest census. Clay County has 9,000 people, 0.2% of which are black. Can we say that this is a racist woman? Uh, I, I mean, I there's this movement, Pat, of we can never call anyone racist because you never know what it is that, that they're actually thinking. If the first way that comes to mind to criticize Michelle Obama is as an ape in heels, Maybe you're a little bit racist. Yeah, we can tell what they're thinking based on the words that come out of their mouth. And you right. gotta love how she gave this non-apology, saying that she's sorry to anyone that she offends. Oh, of course. You have to own up to what you what you did if you're gonna be, give a true apology. I love those apologies, Rachel. Where the apology is, if anybody was offended, it's an apology, but not. I said something absolutely horrible, and there's no excuse or justification whatsoever. And people are talking about free speech, right? Everybody, all anytime something like this happens, people start talking about free speech. I believe in free speech and I believe it is absolutely fine to post this on Facebook and to say it and for the mayor to say, wow, what a breath of fresh air. I really like what you're saying. I also believe that you are not immune to the consequences of your speech. When we talk about free speech in the First Amendment, the government can't prevent you from stating your opinions. Everybody here, Rachel, stated their opinions and those opinions have consequences. Yeah. And you have to be cognizant of when you're putting something on a public platform as a public official, yeah. you are probably going to receive some attention on it, even if it's something positive or something negative. And it's really, again, no surprise that he won 77 uh, percent of the vote there. But another uh, interesting thing that I was kind of thinking about is I, I feel like this election and we've seen we're now seeing this time and time again has brought out really the absolute kind of worst in humanity in terms of all of the racism and anti-Semitism that we're seeing, which is in a stark contrast to what we saw when Obama was elected. And we kind of I saw a lot of the opposite of that. Well, what's fascinating is President Obama's elected and there is record uh, uh, racial and identity based attacks against him. Mm -hmm. And then now that the president no longer is the one with the sort of non agent identity, the attacks now are against other groups that really are, are apparently upsetting to the Trump supporters. It's been sort of reversed, but in a way it's really just been a redirection of who is being attacked with these ideas. And I, I the, the bottom line on this is if you can't criticize a black person without resorting to calling them apes, Maybe you've got something going on racially there that you need to really uh, think about. We're going to take a break. Next, I will speak to Reed Summers. I won't tell you more about this interview, but I think you will find it fascinating. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to the David Pakman Show. I'm joined today in what I think will be a very, very interesting interview by Reed Summers, who's the director of the Society for the New Message from God. He's the son of the messenger, Marshall Vian Summers. I, I'm so fascinated, Reed, by everything you guys have going on over there. I mean, for people who aren't familiar, first of all, with the Society for the New Message from God, is this a church within a religion? Is it a religion in and of itself? How do you describe it? Well, first and foremost, it is a new message from God. It is a communication from the creator of all life for people of all religions hmm. and people of no religion. So first and foremost, it is a message. Um, it is also a worldwide community and a movement worldwide amongst men and women in over 106 countries at this point wow. who are undertaking a return to their own natural innate spirituality hmm. and seeking to find their own unique contribution to a world in need. 
And what does that mean in terms of the sort of physical manifestation? Is there a physical building of prayer that that exists or is this sort of a loosely an amorphous community with with people spread out throughout the world as you mentioned in over a hundred countries people spread out around the globe you know we we are based in boulder colorado yeah um, but we have people every everywhere around the world uh, our works are translated into over 23 languages and we gather global worldwide so it's a worldwide movement of people really rising up at this time of unbelievable challenge, conflict, and division yeah. in our world, uh, rising up to make their own unique contribution, inspired by the spiritual power which lives within them and lives within all people. So you're not, you are not a Christian organization? No, we are not. We are not. We are a new revelation, a new message from the creator of all life. So and God has the, spoken again. Yeah, yeah. that's what I want to yep. get into. So this, this entire thing sort of started around the time that you were born, roughly speaking, your father was was contacted by God. Is that the way that it that it was? Well, 33 years ago, my father was called into the deserts of the American Southwest hmm. by an angelic presence that had been growing in his awareness uh, for years up to that point. And at that moment in the desert, that presence overcame him, spoke through him, right, and instructed him to record. And was he on any kind of hallucinogenics at this time? No, no, he was, you know, he was actually a teacher for blind children oh, wow. um, before that time. Yep, uh, he was simply, this, this simply began to emerge in his life over the course of years and culminated in this encounter in the desert when he was instructed to record. And uh, in the years since, he has done so. And mm -hmm. this voice of revelation has spoken through him uh, in over 800 angelic encounters and in so doing has delivered a new message from the creator of all life for all people speaking on almost every imaginable aspect of world need mm -hmm. uh, and personal need. And why, why your father? In other words, why was your father the recipient of such a message? Well, uh, the new message from God says that my father uh, was sent from the angelic assembly into the world uh, to prepare to receive a pure and complete communication from God to humanity. Wow. Uh, he is a man, you know, he has a human nature. Uh, he has a pretty amazing story, challenging life journey he's taken. And um, it's and a it's mystery. And it's not like, for example, where Jesus, some Christians believe Jesus to be the sort of uh, embodiment of God on our planet. Your dad is just a normal homo sapiens. He is a man in the world. Absolutely. He has a mind and a body and a human nature. Um, he's an immensely grounded, wise, compassionate human being. And yet there is something else, as I think you and your viewers would, would perhaps be able to see if you were to meet him. I think so. There is something else, a deeper spiritual fire that he carries that ignites people, that moves and empowers people. Wow. Is this, um, I, I want to ask this question uh, delicately, but I think it's an important question for anybody who after this interview is going to go and research your organization. Uh, there's questions about whether it is a cult, and I, I hesitate to use that term only because it's a term that could be defined in so many different ways. So maybe we could attack it from a couple of specific angles. Do you encourage the followers of the organization to sort of separate from family and friends who may not uh, accept what it is that are the teachings of your father? Is that something that the followers are encouraged to do? Absolutely not. No. no, I mean, we we are people who have families, extended families. We, we live in Muslim nations, Christian nations, secular nations. And um, we are people who seek to bring the spirit of this revelation, which is really the spirit at the heart of all religions. Right. And and moves in people who have no religion. Hmm. We, we attempt to bring that spirit into our families. And, and that is the spirit of, you know, love and compassion and forgiveness. Um, the ability to listen to another and really understand them and really get them. Mm. So in no way are we focused on separating from this world. We're, we're focused on being in this world, but inspired at a deeper level. I've read with endless fascination some of the instances you've recalled from your childhood, including as young as 10 years old. And, and you have this story, which I don't want to tell for you, but the story I'm referencing just to jog your memory is when you press your ear up against the door of your dad's room and you you both heard and felt something, right? I was just thinking about this the other day. Um, actually, yeah, hmm. tiptoeing on all fours up the stairs at the age of 10, 
because I heard a voice upstairs and it was not the voice of my father. Wow. And going up to the door, pressing the ear to the door and hearing this voice. And I encourage you, know, you and your listeners to go hear this voice because for the first time in history, the voice that spoke to the messengers of the past in the desert, in a cave, at a burning bush, has been recorded and is available for all people to hear. And you believe and that, that is to the be voice God's voice? At, well, this is the voice, this is the voice of revel what we call the voice of revelation. Oh, okay. It is the will and intention of God beyond language being communicated by the angelic presence wow. through the messenger. So it is the voice of the angelic assembly. Now, why did you and, need to sneak up? In other words, was that supposed to be a private moment between the revealer and your dad and you sort of uh, uh, were like a fly on the wall or interrupted the party, so to speak, to use a rather crude analogy? Or why were you just not included in that to begin with, do you think? Well, you know, every angelic encounter uh, has been recorded in its yeah. original audio. And as a kid, I, I think I was sensitive to the fact that I was stomping and romping around the house and throwing things and making general noise and ruckus at a time, at a moment when something really important was happening. And I could feel as a child this pervasive importance, this consequence, this gravity that my parents carried. Being, they're very humble people. My mother was a nurse for decades supporting my father. You know, my father is, is a very um, even you know, man of real kind of solid and substance. And, right. and so they're not extraordinary, extravagant people. And yet here we are having a normal family life and I'm a 10 year old and I could feel the importance, almost fill the home, you know, pervade the space. And so tiptoeing up there to here, I think was, was, I just innately kind of knew I should not, you know, stomp up the stairs hmm. to here. Has yeah. this, has this, uh, uh, uh work of, of, uh, of this, this gospel, I don't know if that's the right term, but has this gospel that your father and, and now you are sort of putting out there for the world, has this made you guys very, very wealthy? No, not at all. My mother retired from her nursing profession two years ago. Hmm. Um, my father took no compensation for decades. Yeah. Um, absolutely not in any way. And I mean, this is, this is an effort to bring a message of activation, activating the human heart to people at a very painful, desperate time in the world. And I think yeah. given the events of last week, you know, the world is roiling in this feeling of anxiety and confusion and frustration because yeah. I'm feeling not that enough now for sure. I, I'm sure you are. I mean, maybe what we're feeling is here we are at this amazing cusp in the world where climate change is accelerating. Human mass migration is sweeping continents. Okay, We have an environmental calamity on our hands, and yet humanity has not come together, sat down at the table, and cooperated sufficiently. Yeah, no doubt and about I, that. I think, yeah, yeah and, and really what the new message is here to do is to call forth a greater good in the human family. So there it has sounds to like, I mean, you're getting into some political issues there. Are, does your organization take a view on something as earthly as gay marriage, for example, or the medical procedure known as abortion? Are those things that you, you guys take a position on or that God has through your dad, as you mentioned? Well, the new message supports and advocates certain things in the world. It doesn't call, call for exact policies, mm. um, but it does honor and recognize individuals who have a gay orientation hmm. and says that gay relationships can possess a higher purpose and meaning wow. and resonance between individuals. Absolutely. Now that is not like most uh, uh, religious folks that I've spoken to. I'll tell you that. This is a new revelation. Yeah. It is new and it is fresh and it is renewed and it is not denigrating anyone. It honors and respects the existing faiths and their communities and says that they and their faith tradition are part of God's ongoing plan to serve the world. Wow. And so this is not about creating an elite group and, you know, that, that is going to be redeemed and saved and empowered above all others. Yeah. Um, this is about calling everyone back to the heart of their spirituality, of their tradition, even if they have no tradition, yep. so that the good can come from too many places to, to be stopped in the world. Hey, last thing and, I want to touch on in the limited time we have, is there any sort of rapture or apocalypse prediction through the messenger that you guys have received from, from God? The new message from God, uh, th this is not the end of times. The okay. new message makes that very clear. This is the beginning Good. of a great transition to a different kind of new world reality, mm -hmm. a world of declining resources, a world where cooperation and unity and compassion have got to be paramount. 
Um, and so there is great urgency in the new message, make no mistake. It is, it is speaking in no uncommon terms of the global crisis in which we live. Yeah. And yet, no, there is no end times. There's no chosen time when certain people will be elevated beyond others. Uh, the human family goes on. And the question is, in what spirit does it go on? Yeah. How unified is it? And are we going to continue to degrade and plunder the world, threatening the very foundations of human civilization? Wow. Well, Reed Summers, you've said it all. I don't know what I could possibly add to this. You really have director of the Society for the New Message from God. Uh, I think our audience will, will really have a lot to look into after this interview. And I really do thank you for talking to us uh, about the new message. And I, for one, found it absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Appreciate you having me. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Megyn Kelly, Fox News host Megyn Kelly's new memoir is making a lot of news, and I want to sort of look at a couple aspects of this. She says in her upcoming memoir that President-elect Trump often tried to offer her gifts in exchange for positive coverage during the 2016 election. This is major, particularly because she says that although she didn't accept any of the gifts, there were journalists who she doesn't name that accepted gifts from Donald Trump. The Associated Press reported yesterday about an excerpt from her memoir, Settle for More, which says that Trump would give journalists and commentators if they were willing to talk him up and if they wanted different gifts, including free airfare, free stays at Trump's various properties. Let's put up a quote here from Settle for More by Megyn Kelly. This is actually one of the untold stories of the 2016 campaign. I was not the only journalist to whom Trump offered gifts clearly meant to shape coverage. Trump tried to work the refs and some of the refs responded. This is smart because the media is full of people whose egos need stroking saying that Trump would work with certain TV hosts also to come up with criticism for himself so they wouldn't be seen as being in the tank for Donald Trump. Uh, she says she resisted these offers, which included like a girl's weekend at Trump's downtown Manhattan hotel or flying her and her husband to his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida. One little question that comes up for me is, why on earth is this an untold story? This should have been a major story during the campaign. Megyn Kelly could have been the hero who went public with it, but I guess going public with it during the campaign doesn't benefit her as much as publishing it in her memoir after the campaign is over. Well, yeah, it's a hush hush because of course the journalists aren't going to reveal that this is what happened. Someone uh, should overcome this ethical conundrum and, and break the story. And she probably should have done that here. Yeah, she's emerging now as the most sought after star in television news and getting offers for contracts about 20 million. And quite frankly, even if she had made this admission before, I don't think it would have changed anything. No, I mean, like we know, Trump could shoot people on Fifth Avenue. He <laughs> could make fun of disabled people. Oh, he did. He could uh, uh, talk about grabbing by the pussy. Oh, he did that. He could talk about women being pigs. Oh, he did that as well. None of these things affected him. So. The fact that he was trying and apparently, according to Megyn Kelly, successfully bought journalists off would not likely have changed the election results. But it would have been nice of her to bring it up. And like Trump, Megyn Kelly is a very smart person who is selling her book. She wants to sell it to the largest number of people possible, left and right. And more than likely, she is going to successfully do that because a lot of what is in this book is very, very compelling. Her also, though, and I want to make sure we get to this other aspect, Megyn Kelly is also now coinciding with the release of her memoir, talking about how, yes, Roger Ailes, the embarrassed Fox News chief, harassed her as well. She was a victim of sexual harassment at the hands of former Fox News CEO Roger Ailes. She went on the Dr. Phil show. I don't know that we very often play clips of the Dr. Phil show on this program, but uh, I have a little bit of it and it is absolutely fascinating. And you'll remember that in the wake of all sorts of women coming out and saying, you know, I was also victimized, sexually harassed by Roger Ailes. Megyn Kelly was criticized for waiting very long in the game to come out and say, you know, yeah, I, I also am aware of some of this stuff and 
et cetera, et cetera. I think that that was not a good critique of Megyn Kelly. We know all of the different reasons why it is perfectly normal and common and logical for many victims of sexual harassment not to be overly eager to go out and to make those allegations public. That being said, she is doing it now. Here is a clip from her talking to Dr. Phil yesterday. Were you sexually harassed by Roger Ailes? Yes. Beginning when? My problems with Roger began when I was at the company for 12 months. So I was a first year reporter. And I was called up to New York. Britt Hume, my direct manager in the DC Bureau, told me I had captured the attention of Mr. Ailes and told me to, he wanted to see me in New York. So I went up to New York. I was working in the Washington DC Bureau. And I went up there. I had met with him, I think, once before you know, for my job interview. But this was a great moment for me, because you want to capture the attention of your boss. And he gave me a bunch of advice. You know, I went into, into his office, he gave me a bunch of advice. But the problem with that meeting and with several that happened over the next six months was not only was there legitimate professional advice, but there were grossly inappropriate comments. Hmm. He, he had always had an inappropriate sense of humor. You know, the, the, he is not PC. And this was actually something we liked about him. I mean, he's, he'll crack a dirty joke or drop a swear, and so will I. I that, I don't judge that. You know, I don't speak the Queen's English either, as you'll see in the book there. I mean, just FYI. Yeah, by the book. <laughs> um, Many copies. But this was something different. This was specific comments about my body, how he wanted to see me, and it grew more severe over time. Like, what was he? Give me an example. Well, like he said, he knew I must have some very sexy bras, <laughs> and he'd like to see me in them. That smooth operator, Roger Ailes, man, that, that gets the women every time when you tell them, I'm going to guess at what you have in your underwear drawer at home. Uh, so obviously the response from, <laughs> from Roger Ailes' lawyer, not surprising, which is this is all bogus. But the more interesting response to me was from Bill O'Reilly, who went on CBS yesterday and he said he's not interested in making the network look bad at all. And then he added the following on his own show, which I'll put up on the screen for you. If somebody is paying you a wage, you owe that person or company allegiance. You don't like what's happening in the workplace. Go to human resources or leave. I've done that. And then take the action you need to take afterward if you feel aggrieved. There are labor laws in this country, but don't run down the concern that supports you by trying to undermine it. Bill O'Reilly seems to see this as just sort of like a PR issue for Fox and employee relations rather than the fact that they had a serial sexual harasser on staff. For Bill O'Reilly, it's more about the right positioning of how you complain and when and to who and making my network look bad. Bill O'Reilly seems to see sexual harassment as a PR issue, which makes sense because it became a major PR issue for him when he was talking to Andrea Macris about, you know, pleasuring herself and all sorts of stuff. This has clearly been a big PR issue for Bill O'Reilly, but he doesn't see this as an issue of sexual harassment, which is really what it is. Well, that's also coming from someone who has been accused of sexual harassment. But yeah. I think what's also interesting here is that where Megyn Kelly is positioned now, because she has to try and kind of appeal to her new lean in fan base while also balancing that with a lot of Fox News watchers who really hate identity politics. Yeah. So where does that leave her? I think it's super interesting, actually. You know, I'm not a big fan of Megyn Kelly, Pat, but I think that what she is doing here, the timing of it, of course, is, is very susceptible to a sort of motivation of selling books. And there's no doubt she's going to sell a lot of books for this. Uh, for these appearances, but she's positioned herself in a really interesting place now where she is both seen as the sort of commanding up and coming television star, but also someone who is not going to be pushed around, even if it's about sexual harassment by a male superior, which is not exactly a position that lots of her fan base is super thrilled to be out in front of and criticizing publicly. And all the allegations that she's given so far seem to have happened right when she started working for Fox News. Yeah. She continued to get promotions, got uh, very generous maternity leaves. So yep. you have to wonder if this kind of thing continued and she's just keeping quiet about it. There, That's the other aspect of it, which is do you sort of become immune to this when you have higher status in the network? We saw that Gretchen Carlson, who not as well known as, as Megyn Kelly and not of the same uh, sort of uh, stature on the network seem to be continually subjected to this type of thing. Of course, uh, Roger Ailes denies it all at this point. Really no reason to believe the denials.
We have a voicemail number. It's 2192 David P. We have not heard from the Louisiana troll for a while, but he has really been activated by the results of last week's election. And, and I want to hear from him now. You know what sucks, Pac Man? Um, the fact that Democrats will never win another national election. Hmm. And I'm going to tell you why. Okay. Uh, if Trump does bring back jobs to the Rust Belt and pretty much a lot of, you know, kind of the rural states in America where there are minorities, by the way, um, unlike what you think, minorities don't just all live in inner city ghettos <laughs> like you left this like to, uh, to claim for some weird racist reason. Um, they're going to see, well, here's, here's the thing. You leftists use minorities as a tool for Democrat votes. That's it. And I could prove that by two different things. Just look how nasty you guys are to minorities who don't vote, uh, D. I mean, just turn to, you know, Anna Kasparian's video where she unleashed on women who voted for Trump, calling them all stupid and idiots. Or look at some of your videos where you call, um, you know, minorities who don't vote D, Uncle Tom, and some other yeah. nasty, nasty language. Matt, the Louisiana troll calls in and everything, he, all his comments are based on things that just have never happened. I feel like he's watching other shows and he thinks it's this show and then he calls in and leaves us voicemail. Number one, it was Trump actually who talked about inner cities interchangeably with talking about minorities. It's Trump who made that assumption. And number two, when have we ever called any Republic, any black person who doesn't vote for a Democrat and Uncle Tom? We haven't. And in fact, the data demonstrates that there is no justification to the idea that black voters in 08 and 2012 voted for President Obama because he was black. So Louisiana troll, it's always great to hear from him, I guess. Not really, but I guess it's OK to hear from him. But you've got to call in about stuff that we've actually said. We've got a great bonus show for you today. Please become members. You'll get instant access. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.